During the Cuomo administration, state policymakers took steps to ensure that workers' compensation claims could be filed for stress-related injuries suffered by first responders, addressing previous limitations based on the idea that those ramifications were a normal side effect of these stressful occupations. Now Democratic state lawmakers want to go a step further, ensuring that all workers in New York have access to post-traumatic stress disorder coverage under the state's workers' compensation system. To discuss this initiative, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Joe Kennedy. Cannabis, special counsel for the New York State AFL-CIO, which championed this legislation. Welcome to the show, Joe. Thanks for having me, David. I really appreciate it uh, and appreciate you raising awareness of this important issue. Well, we appreciate you lending your time. So under existing state law, workers in what professions or, or, or types of professions are eligible to submit a workers' compensation claim for uh, stress-related injuries specifically? Right now, PTSD or in workers' board, workers' compensation board parlance, extreme stress is covered under the law. We see in claims where the workplace stress is related to or comes at the same time as a physical injury, these claims are routinely covered. The focus of this bill is predominantly or really solely claims that are uh, stress only, where there is no corresponding physical injury. And right now under the law, the employer can assert a defense, basically that the employer or the employee should have expected the level of stress that they encountered. Back in 2017, as part of a larger workers' comp reform, employers of first responders right, were prohibited from asserting this defense. So uh, police, fire, and EMTs, right, uh, those workers' claims are not subject to this defense. The bill that we're talking about, uh, sponsored by Assemblymember Reyes and Senator Ramos, would expand that prohibition, right? And the prohibition is on the, the employer's defense so that employers wouldn't be able to assert that, that defense with respect to claims from any worker. Well, before we get into the proposal and the changes it would uh, mean for the system, can you walk us through, generally speaking, what it means to file a workers' compensation claim? Because I have to imagine for a lot of people, if they've gone their whole professional life without interacting with the system, really aren't familiar with it. So what might prompt someone to make a workers' compensation claim? For example, is it only if you're unable to work? And who's responsible for paying them out? Right now, just about every worker in the state is covered by the workers' compensation system, and it covers any workplace injury. So you mentioned folks who are out of work, Right. Yes, there are some folks who are so severely hurt that they can't work anymore. But then there are also what we call medical only claims. Mm -hmm. And if you think about, you know, the types of claims as a spectrum on one end of the spectrum, you have you know the claims where there is no or little lost time. Right. Where all the worker needs is coverage for the medical care that they need to get back on the job quickly. On the other end of the spectrum, you know, unfortunately, there are some fatalities. And there are folks who are really grievously injured and can't ever go back to work. And then, you know, in the middle, you have the folks who have a significant injury, may need some time off from work, and they would be entitled to medical care. And then also indemnity, which is the the industry parlance for wage replacement. Where does the money come from? In New York, there's a couple of ways that employers can fulfill their obligation to, to maintain coverage. The most prevalent in the system is where the employer goes out and buys an insurance policy. They buy a workers' compensation policy from one of a number of carriers, and the worker would then submit a claim similar to a claim on on any other type of insurance policy. That's about two-thirds of the system or one-third of the system. The coverage is provided by employers that are self-insured, but the employer of the worker is ultimately the one paying for the coverage. Well, returning to the proposal that uh, moved through the legislature this year, it seems like the big headline is that it removes those specific carved out uh, professions that would be eligible for uh, a stress injury only and seems to make the benefit available to all workers. Um, Why is that an important expansion? I think that it's important that we consider the workers' compensation system uh, you know, the same way that we consider regular health care coverage. It provides parity. Regardless of the type of injury, the worker would be covered. 
unfortunately, under the current system, there is this regressive approach to these mental health care claims. And this would put workers who are making claims for uh, mental only injuries on the same footing as they would be if they were accessing care through their traditional health care coverage. So in addition to expanding this benefit to all workers, the proposal strikes out this idea that the extraordinary work-related stress is incurred in a quote-unquote work-related emergency and just says that if it occurs at work. Why does it make sense to lower that threshold? So right now for a physical injury, there's no requirement that it happen in any specific you know, workplace emergency. Again, this is about parity. You know, and I just want to take a moment to highlight, you know, what I see as the absolute absurdity when it comes to the treatment of these mental only claims. We represent a lot of workers who work in dangerous industries. Think about a chef. If they sustain a burn in the course of their work, that burn is going to be covered. There is no argument on the other side that the, the worker could have expected the burn so they shouldn't be covered. And, and you know, that goes for healthcare. A healthcare worker that injures their back attempting to help move a patient, you know, a construction worker that is injured using a piece of equipment. Just because the injury is foreseeable doesn't mean that it's not covered. And that's the way it should be. And all we're doing here is creating parity on these mental health claims. During the assembly debate, the argument or one of the arguments made by the sponsor for the expansive nature of this legislation was the experience of healthcare workers during the pandemic. But the work they were doing during that was during a healthcare emergency. This was a unique set of circumstances. So if that's the comparison we're going to make, it seems like at least for some professions that the emergency definition is important uh, in terms of a a threshold for when a stress-related injury occurs. My concern with that approach is that you are putting, or we would be putting another limit on the ability to access care. You know, you mentioned the pandemic. This issue, you know, predates the pandemic, but the pandemic is an excellent example of why we need it. If you think about the healthcare workers that were going to work in February of 2020, there is no way that they could have expected to incur the stress associated with a global pandemic. But at some point after that, that expectation existed, right? Uh, It developed. And, uh, you know, we have this situation now where these workers at the beginning of the pandemic would likely have been covered. Their employers would likely not be able to successfully assert this defense. But at some point afterwards, that developed. And I wouldn't take as a given that the workers' comp board and the courts would say that the entire pandemic was a workplace emergency. You know, one of the frustrations with this piece of legislation or with this approach is that the defense that we're talking about was not created through statute. It was created through a workers' comp board uh, adjudicatory process that was ultimately upheld by the courts. So, I, you know, I, I wouldn't take it as a given um, that the entire pandemic would constitute a, a workplace emergency with respect to healthcare worker claims. And, you know, another important thing to mention here and to highlight is that employers will continue to have all of the other tools that they have to uh, to refute and dispute claims. Uh, All we're doing in this piece of legislation, all that would be done here is remove the ability to assert the defense. So we're taking these claims from an impossibility and we're just making them still extremely difficult because the worker's burden would then still be to prove that they are suffering from PTSD, that it is work related, and the employer would still have all of the tools or the carrier would still have all of the tools at their disposal that they currently have now to dispute any case. They could make claims that the medical evidence isn't sufficient, question the the work relatedness of it. I want to be very clear. All we're doing with this piece of legislation is removing a defense. We're not creating a presumption, you know, which would really facilitate these claims. We're simply preventing the carriers from blocking these claims. So is there any sort of reasonableness standard for determining a worker's compensation claim? For example, 
under this legislation, if it became law, how would something like this be handled? You have uh, a person who gets stressed out at work to the point where they can't work anymore, but say none of their peers uh, who are doing the same function are suffering the same stress. Would I be eligible for workers' compensation under this proposal or could an employer say, well, no one else is getting stressed out uh, by this and they're able to perform their functions, so this person's claim should be tossed out? It's important to consider it from this perspective. Uh, we have folks in the workplace, uh, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to again compare this to how we treat physical injuries. You know, we have folks in the workplace of you know, varying ages, varying physical abilities, and you know, one, uh, one situation that might cause an injury to uh, you know, someone who is not as fit, someone who is not as young, right, they'll still be covered even if the same type of physical stress wouldn't cause the same injury in one of their coworkers. Uh, again, you know, I try to keep coming back to the fact that this is just parity. Treating mental health the same way that we treat any other type of care in the system. And David, for the vast majority of workers' comp claims, as they are now, and you know what we anticipate if this legislation is, is enacted, the overwhelming majority of workers' comp claims are either medical only or you know workers who are out of work for only a very short amount of time. This change, for the most part, is going to help workers who simply need care. Right, getting them the mental health care uh, services that they need is going to enable them to continue to work on the job. And again, you know, there's been a lot of rhetoric around this bill. This is the thrust here, and the focus here is to make sure that the workers get the care that they need. So every time we add a, you know, an exception or a caveat to that, it opens up the, uh, you know, the adjudicatory process for the carriers to come in and, you know deny claims, and delay care. And after a quick break, we'll continue our discussion about stress-related workers' compensation claims in New York with Joe Cannavis, Special Counsel for the New York State AFL-CIO. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. Visit unionstrongny.org for more information. This is WCNY's The Capitol Press Room, and we're continuing our discussion about legislation that would expand the opportunities for workers in New York to submit stress-related workers' compensation claims. And our guest is Joe Cannavis, special counsel for the New York State AFL-CIO. Well, what do you see as the potential additional cost to employers by expanding the availability of this uh, claim? I'm going to tell you not necessarily what I see as the additional cost, but what the New York Compensation Insurance Rating Board sees as the potential additional cost here. The public actuary for the New York Compensation Insurance Ratings Board, which is the entity that for all intents and purposes sets uh, workers' comp rates in the state, uh, that public actuary did a study on this legislation and said that it will result in an increase in cost to the system of 15 hundredths of 1%. So if you think about the workers' comp system, generally we use the, the number of about $10 billion a year. So on a $10 billion a year system, this would result in an increase of less than $12 million. And I don't want to uh, sound preachy here, but you know when you think about ten billion dollars, so a uh, billion dollars is a thousand million. So we have ten thousand million dollars, right? That's the size of the system, and this change would would increase costs by less than twelve million dollars. According to the governor's twenty twenty two veto, though, she notes that the New York Compensation Insurance Rating Board's uh, public actuary note uh, noted that these cost estimates are highly imprecise, and she found that the legislation comes with a significant cost. So where's the disconnect between that assessment and your assessment that uh, this would uh, be hardly a blip on the radar? The cost analysis that I mentioned did provide a range. The range went from five one-hundredths of one percent 
to, uh, I believe, 97 one hundredths of 1%, but they said that the best estimate that they could provide was 15 one hundredths of 1%. So, you know, when you, when you work with actuaries in the insurance industry, they, they pretty much always provide a range, but then they always say, but despite the range that we're providing, we believe that this is the best estimate. And the best estimate that they provided was 15 one hundredths of 1%. And what's the effectiveness of this measure if it became law? For example, we've had a lot of so-called burnout from the pandemic. Would people who experienced stress previously be allowed to file claims based on what happened already? Or would this be taking effect for incidents moving forward only? The way that the legislation is drafted is that it would only take effect going forward prospectively. But I, I just want to take the time to, to just, if you would give me uh, an opportunity to, to, to lay out a, a hypothetical here. The way, that this, uh, the way that this defense works and the way that it is applied, you could have several different workers have the same experience, but then have different levels of coverage. Uh, so the, you know, if you think about this in terms of a, you know, a highway crash, Right. You have a bunch of workers that go out and respond to a highway crash. So the first responders, the firefighters, the police, the EMTs, right, if they sustain PTSD as a result of what they witnessed, their employers would not be able to assert this defense. Say there's a, a utility crew, right, because the crash involves a utility pole, the utility workers their employers would be able to assert the defense, but the utility workers would likely be able to overcome that defense because they're not in the business of routinely responding and routinely experiencing, you know, the types of stress that's associated with, you know, a bad highway crash, right? So you have two different types of workers, both with the same outcome. Ultimately, if they're able to prove the rest of their claim, they'll be covered. If you then consider that there might be a reporter, right, who is dispatched to go cover the scene, right? If that reporter then de develops PTSD as a result of what they saw in that scene, their employer would be able to assert the defense and they would most likely be successful if that reporter was routinely dispatched to, you know, crime scenes, accident scenes. If that reporter saw something that they, there that the employer could, could say was just, you know, part of the normal routine stress of the job, the employer would be successful and the worker would not be successful. So you have one set of circumstances and you have several different types of workers. And depending on what basically what their job is and what they, uh, you know, what they experience on a day to day basis, right, is going to is going to impact how their, you know, how their their uh, claim would be handled. And if you think any one of those workers that sustained a physical injury on that same scene would be covered. Well, before we move on, let me reintroduce you for listeners just joining us. This is the Capitol Press Room, and we're speaking with Joe Cannavis, special counsel for the New York State AFL-CIO, which is pushing for legislation expanding the opportunities for workers in New York to submit stress-related workers' compensation claims. It seems like the best case scenario for this legislation, if it was to be implemented, is that employers would then take steps to proactively help their workforce avoid stressful situations or uh, provide uh, mental health services so that uh, they were able to handle stress when it occurred. But I could also imagine employers being wary or more wary when hiring. For example, if there was, sticking with that reporter analogy, someone who uh, you know, had to resign from a job because of stress, maybe they won't give that reporter a second chance at another outlet. So are you concerned at all about those sort of unintended consequences of employers now trying to weed out uh, these potential mental health uh, problems uh, before they can materialize on the job? First, as an initial response to your question, uh, employers discriminating in the hiring process against any worker. Well, it's not discriminating. Of, uh, if you're saying, you know, you previously had, you know, a tough time and you, you decided that uh, 
journalism wasn't the right fit for you, but now you're making uh, an effort to go back into it. Uh, I'm a little unsure of your past track record. And with this new workers' compensation dynamic, I don't want to take the risk. I don't know if that would fall under uh, discrimination, would it? I think that it would be disability discrimination, which is prohibited by state law, by federal law, and in some areas of the state, even by local law. And what's the disability? Uh, that like you, Burnout now constitutes a disability? I think that an employer making a hiring decision based on somebody's you know, mental health um, you know, diagnoses is is uh, is discriminatory. Even if it's self-diagnosed? No, there's there is. Like I know reporters who, from the experience of the pandemic, said, "This isn't for me. I'm going to walk away. I'm going to do communications." For example, maybe a few years later, they say, "You know, what? I'm ready to go back into reporting." me as an employer, I now go, well, wh why did you leave journalism in the first place? Well, you know, the whole thing became a little too much for me and I was ready for a change. Well, now me as an employer, as I'm considering this person under this new law, maybe I say, well, now this person might be able to file a claim against me uh, if they can't do the, the job for some reason in the future. So why, why wouldn't that be a, a reasonable outcome from this uh, law? Again, I, I don't think that employers making decisions on hiring based on an employee's disability uh, or the potential for workers comp claim is discriminatory there's gotcha. there's also separate uh discrimination protections under the workers comp law well we've been speaking with joe cannabis their special counsel for the new york state afl cio joe i really appreciate you walking us through uh, the workers compensation system and this proposed expansion thank you so much David, thank you. And again, thank you for raising awareness of this important issue. Uh, you know, it's an issue that's important to the labor movement, uh, to our president, Mario Salento, and to our board of directors. And, uh, you know, I also want to uh, thank the sponsors of the legislation, both union members, again, Senator Ramos and Assemblymember Reyes. Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by New York State United Teachers, a statewide union of nearly 700,000 professionals in education and healthcare.